great. Um, I think Holly and Matt and Connor have done a terrific job of sort of setting the table for you. And I'm just going to sit here and show you pictures of my kid with a big fish. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, this is out Seagull Lake. This is up on the north end. Um, and uh, my son there is about four. So the walleye is also probably about maybe a little four or five. Yeah. So we'll, we'll judge everything in reference to those two things. So uh, thank you all for being here. I guess I have a little, a little extra time, so I'm going to go a little bit slower. Um, maybe than I normally would, and I've hidden some slides that I may unhide. Um, so um, I'm going to take you through it. Uh, a few of the goals that I have quickly is um, I just want to sort of orient you a little bit to the history of walleye in Oswego Lake. It didn't start with the stocking of walleye in 2000. Walleye has been here for a while in various stages, and we're going to go a little bit through that. Um, we're going to take a look at uh, the project itself and overview, and I'm going to sort of tiptoe a little bit through the tulips and just sort of hit the highlights of all of this. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the Ally Free introduction. We've already sort of jumped into that quite a bit with uh, Holly and Matt and Connor. Um, then I'm going to give you a little summary of, of everything to do with the reintroduction itself. And then I want to share a little bit about what we've learned. Um, and hopefully I can give you one little nugget that you can take away from this that you might go away with. Uh, current status in the future. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have time for a few quick questions. Um, sounds like we will. Oh my goodness. Um, so usually I like to load all the thank yous at the front because sometimes, actually this, in my mind, this is the most important slide. Today's actually, for me, it's a celebration of 15 years of walleye in Otsego Lake that I, these are my babies, they're right out here. I pretty much, almost all of them have gone through my little fingers. Um, and so every time someone catches one, ah, I'm happy about that. So um, DDC, um, even some old folks up there, Norm McBride, Steve Lawrence, Scott Wells, Tim McCorney, um, my Uncle Dave is up there. Um, Sue Coleskill, John Foster is sitting right there. Um, most of the, the heavy lifting um, for a lot of this have come from this group of, of uh, students uh, under his tutelage here. So thank you to John for, for all of your work and all of your students' hard work. And um, Cornell, Tom Brooking, I don't know if Tom is in the room, but couldn't have done this without Tom and Lars. Uh, SUNY Oneonta Biological Field Station, we're super lucky to have a, a field station right on this jewel of the lake. So um, uh, thank you to Bill Harmon and Holly and Matt, Paul Lord, Dan Stitch, um, Local benefactors, Lou Hager, uh, Doug Willies, the Otsego County Conservation Association, these are the money people who have purchased a good part of the walleye that have gone into the lake at a cost of around 33 cents a piece, which is pretty good. Um, then the other half of the walleye that have been stocked in the lake have come from um, the Oneida Fish Culture Station and um, the, the walleye pond fingerling stocking um, experts um, out at South Otsego and those DEC folks that bring us all those little pond fairings, so those are great. So thank you to those folks. Um, also, we have some private growers, uh, Steve Sanford and Phil Faber. Unfortunately, Steve is in a nursing home uh, right now, believe it or not. I don't know if you know Steve, but uh, he's one of the best private growers in the state. He can grow a walleye and mud puddle. Um, and then um, uh, students and interns. And what's really cool about this project that's gone on for so long that some of the students and interns have now moved into some of these other groups, um, which is really cool to see. So some of the interns that we had working at Cobal Skill or working at the field station have now moved on into positions with the DEC um, and, and so forth. So um, raise your hand if you've been involved with this project. And come on, don't be shy. So there's a couple dozen of you in the room right now. Dan Stitch is back, thank you. Uh, and along the way, I keep Going back to this, um, I want to try to include some references to their work. So I want to try to give people credit uh, on the slide where credit is due. At least I'm going to try. And if I if I slay you, I apologize. Oh, here's another busy slide. Um, so what I did um, when I was preparing this talk is I went through the field station's archives, and you can all get all these papers um, on the uh, uh, the Oneonta Biological Field Station website. They're all available by PDF. Every one of these is a title that has walleye in the 
in the name. Um, so, oh my gosh, um, 30 um, papers and theses have been written on this in the last 15 years, and you can all go and download them right now on your smartphone. Um, so I just wanted to pay some homage to the science so um, that we can, that you know where some of the basis of this talk is coming from. So, and then we started stocking um, in 2000, and I, we're gonna say, who are we here? Uh, I'm gonna use the Royal We, the DEC, SUNY Oneana, SUNY Cope Skill, local benefactors for the money and cooperative growers. So what was the goal? Um, we actually followed one of the objectives in the purse at sampling um, manual, um, where uh, the goal, and this is the actual goal, was to reintroduce walleye to what Seagull Lake, the primary management goal of reestablishing the walleye fishery. This is how, um, you know, sitting down with the folks um, in Albany, this is sort of where we put a stake and said this is what we want to do and this is why we're putting walleye back into Watsego. And so if you take a look at the walleye management plan um, that FESTA had all put together, it is not known if walleye are native to Otsego Lake and the Susquehanna drainage. There are some opinions both ways. Scott and I were just talking about it um, yesterday. So You've seen a couple of timelines. Let me put one more out there for you. It's a little cartoon-ish, um, but I'm going to go through it anyway because I did a lot of hard work. Um, 1916, walleye were first reported in angler creels um, when a few fish were caught by anglers in tributaries to Otsego Lake. This is in um, Bob McWaters, uh, the fishes of Otsego Lake. Uh, fry were routinely stocked from 1913 to 1934. 1922 to 1934, the heaviest stocking went about a little over four million fry were added to the lake. Um, and uh, the state of the lake report that um, the field station put together has this quote in it, as does McBride and Sanford. Uh, Norm McBride and Kay Sanford, the two biologists that we started working with on this project in Region 4. Uh, I got my first fisheries job with Kay. Uh, walleye were present in the 1935 biological survey by Odell and Senning. Uh, 1938, stocking by the Isaac Walton League led to reported good fishing for this species from the 40s to the early 60s. And during a lake trout study by McBride and Sanford, um, they, um, actually before McBride and Sanford, McBride and Sanford summarized a lake trout survey in the 50s that recorded walleye while they were looking for lake trout. That's what that quote says. Um, then in the, uh, the 60s and 70s, the catch rate fell uh, 2.03 walleye per net. No walleye were collected um, in uh, 1988 and 1990. And then we got alewife in 86. The last scientifically collected walleye were in a gill net by SUNY Oneonta Biological uh, Field Station staff when three walleye were collected in a net. Foster 1993 documented that. So uh, from 1938 to 2000, no walleye were stocked. And in 2000, this walleye stocking effort got underway in this collaborative sort of outlined fashion. So um, another way of looking at it is um, Scott Wells right over here, there, uh, <laughs> put together a really nice poster that sort of documented this along with Holly, um, where um, um, I, I sort of snipped your poster, I'm sorry. Uh, and I, I put it up there. I'm not going to walk you through it, but essentially a lot of the things that I just walked you through are up there. But what it struck me what Scott said about this the other day. Um, Cisco occupied the whitefish, then the smelt occupied the Cisco, then the alewife occupied the smelt. And now the lake whitefish are slowly bouncing back. And Matt and Holly had a really good um, little tail end of their cold water thing where the lake whitefish were coming back. And you're going to hear a talk from Samantha Carey in just a minute talking about what we're going to do with lake whitefish. Um, so this is a story of uh, successive competition for resources through successive invasions. And so um, if I were to summarize it in just a, uh, maybe a one little teeter-totter sort of thing, we heard Matt and Holly talk about how Otsego Lake is sort of on a balance point between oligotrophy or being very, uh, you know, fairly nutrient poor and mesotrophy being more enriched. 
And basically, where are the nutrients locked up in the internal cycling of nutrients in the lake is extremely important on, to, make, to how the lake looks. So Otsego is sort of teetering between oligotrophy and mesotrophy, and where the nutrients are locked up is extremely important. If the lake is green, they're probably locked up in algae. If the lake is blue, they're probably locked up in large body crustacean zooplankton, right? So the food, the, the internal cycling of nutrients in the food web itself is very important which way the relationship is flipped, right? That's sort of, that, that's it, the whole thing. <laughs> um, so still hanging on um, are lake whitefish, and Sam's going to talk about that in a second. And we still have um, what we would call a vestigial population of smelt. Uh, we still do have a, a small smelt run, and we're still looking at, at that. Um, so we do see smelt slowly starting to come back, and, and, they're, and they're getting a little bit bigger. And so the lake whitefish are slowly starting to come back. I kind of think I'm a little, in my mind, I'm slightly uh, optimistic and worried because we're doing, I think things are really good out here, but the table is almost set for the next big thing. Is it going to be the next big thing? Is it going to be lake whitefish? Or is it going to be, are owl life really gone? We'll talk about that in a second. So owl life, uh, here they are. We know what they are. Um, we won't go over it anymore. Um, but what I will say is um, it had a little bit to do with um, our, our um, walleye are a good choice here, in my mind, because owl life were extremely abundant. And we'll, we'll get to a graphic in just a second. But what we got here is um, we've looked at the lake three times a year, spring, summer, fall, with hydroacoustic gear, going back to the late 90s. And um, so we have a pretty good idea of what the density and um, biomass of owl life are um, over pretty much every year in that time period. And to give you an idea of how many are out there, if you looked at Brian Wydell's slides earlier, he was, for Lake Ontario, he was in the Three to 5,000 fish per hectare, Brian, are you here? Is, was, that, was that right? In 2002, uh, we had over 10,000 owl life per hectare. Um, and if you were to put some bounds on this and you looked at the top end, um, we're talking about 22 million owl life in the lake. And if you were to extrapolate that out and you were to put your arms out like this, there would be an owl life under your arms. Um, so that's a pretty impressive uh, number of fish. And they were, you could almost strike an asymptote with their, with, with their growth and with them limiting their own size. I can still see it in my mind. It's like 128 millimeters and go on an infinite. And it would never, they would get increasingly close to that and never get bigger than that because there were so many of them. Um, so why walleye? Uh, uh, this is an echogram that Dave Warner and I put together during a hydroacoustic survey. This is taking a slice, going across the lake, um, you know, measuring owl life density and, and, and biomass with a, with, a, with a biosonics unit. And uh, what a perfect shaped glacial valley, right? You, you're sitting in earth science class when I was in ninth grade, and this is what you learned a, a glacial valley was like. It's a perfectly U-shaped glacial valley with what you should look at is a very abbreviated littoral zone, right? Hardly any plants on the sides, and a huge bathtub shape with a, with a massive amount of open water. And this is during stratification, and everything uh, up here is an owl life. Um, we heard a talk earlier today on uh, is it an owl life, is it a perch? I can tell you that 99.9% .9 of everything out there is an owl life. Uh, by, because we trawled, we gill netted, we did the homework, and the lake is stratified. So the redder the dot is up there, the more red you see, the closer the owl life are all bunched up together, right? And so there are uh, abundant, abundant prey in, in the Atlantean. And you heard Holly talk earlier about how the predators are spatially separated from the prey during stratification. So the lake stratifies, and the lake trout go deep, right? And then the owl life are up shallow, and never the twain shall really meet. Now, of course, there are a few lunatic brown trout like hanging out here at the toe of the thermal climb, of course. But most everything down here, the huge predation pressure, doesn't really happen until wintertime when the thing flips. 
And we already heard that owlets hate, hate, hate cold water, right? So owlets spend the winter time down at the bottom of the lake where the water temperature is warmer. You know, ice floats, so the warmest water at the bottom. And so that's where the owlets are, right? And so the lake trout, that's the only time, really, that that many owlets and lake trout overlap. So it sort of set the stage for us wanting to have a predator that would go out here and forage for owlets in the open water. Now, I kind of like to think of walleyes as having two sort of lifestyles. One, sort of a, uh, a big open water predator, and then the other, sort of like a, you know, a, a weed walleye. A walleye that, this grew, what I grew up fishing for walleye, I grew up fishing for walleyes and weeds. And so, and I think those two lifestyles, now remember that the weed walleye and the open water walleye, because I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. So, um, walleye, do eat that life. Uh, this is a walleye from this lake. Uh, any walleye that's been caught in Scott Wells' gill nets, region, region forest gill nets, Chris Van Warren's gill nets, we always look at the stomachs. Always, always, always. And so our, the walleye, our walleye, my walleye, are, are running around uh, eating, uh, e eating alleye for sure. Uh, so that's why walleye, because we would hope that they would forage for open water um, alleye and knock them down. And, to increase angling opportunity for walleye. Who doesn't like to catch walleye? I love to catch and eat walleye. So increased angling opportunity for walleye was absolutely a goal of this project as well. And um, we're benefiting from, from that right now. So we stocked two kinds of walleye in the lake. We stocked pond fingerling walleye at the end of June. So walleye, what they do is um, when they're in a pond anywhere, they uh, run around eating plankton, zooplankton, until they're like an inch and a quarter or an inch and a half long. And then they switch over to piscivory. So after they stop eating plankton, they're going to cannibalize themselves if you don't get them out of the ponds. So it makes sense, it's kind of more beneficial. When a walleye gets to an inch and three quarters, two inches max, you need to get them out of your ponds or else they're going to cannibalize themselves or you need to bring like thousands of pounds of fat and minnows to keep them. So you need to get them, this is a great, this is a perfect walleye net right here. Every walleye looks beautiful. So these are pond fingerling walleye stocked at the end of June. And then we had fall fingerling walleye. Most of them were brought by Steve Sanford. You know, they were four to six inch fish, usually in October or November is when he would bring them. And every one of those fall fish, it's important to know, was clipped. So we clipped all of our fall fish so that we could tell them apart from our pond fish, okay? Um, this is one of my ponds, unfortunately, um, where I tried to raise exclusively pond fingerling walleye. And so this fish is the same age as this fish. And how do you think that this fish got that big? It ran around and ate all of its little brothers and sisters to grow that big. So that's how you know you've not done a really great job at managing the plankton in your pond and you've kind of screwed it up a little bit. I see Brent laughing. Yeah. So here's another example of one of my ponds uh, where you, you have this monster in here that's exactly the same age as all the others. Um, so, stocking walleye. Uh, we, well, if the walleye would uh, come off the truck from whatever source, we would put them on the field station's barge in transport tanks and we would run them out around the lake, uh, stocking them on the edge of the weeds. And, um, the summary is, and you've seen a slide of this already, 608,000 walleye were stocked in these 15 years of the project, uh, 512,000 pond fingerlings, those little guys, and then um, you know, 96,000 or so um, uh, advanced fish that were you know, four to six inches long. Some of them were even a little bit bigger. Now, remember this ratio here a little bit. Uh, we'll call it five to one, all right? Five to one, everybody with me? Yes. See some knots. Good. Okay, here comes a couple of figures. Um, this is going to require a little explanation. We wanted to do an experiment to see what was eating all of those pond fingerling walleyes. Remember the little guys, these little guys like this, everything under the sun, they're like little minnows, is going to eat them, right? So you drive around the lake and stock them, and it is like ringing the dinner bell. There's going to be everything under the sun eats them. And so what we did is we did an experiment. We stocked half of our pond fish during the day, and we stocked the other half of our pond fish during the night. Okay, and then we ran around and sained. We set crews of teams of saners out to look at the diets of predators. 
So large mouth, small mouth, chain pickerel, rock bass, yellow perch, and even some bluegills once in a while were eating our baby walleyes. So we would pump their stomach, we would lavage the stomachs of these predators, right? And we would see what they were eating. And those five predators are, in fact, what we're mainly eating are, are walleye. And there were there was, there was a lot of them. a lot of them being eaten. Um, this is frequency of occurrence. This is just a presence absence thing. Um, is it in a stomach or is it not? And what you see here is um, this whole group of predators, and I've taken a little bit of license here, and I've grouped them into one rather than present five different graphs of a pickerel stomach and a bass stomach and whatever. I group them into one. And so we'll call this um, the beforehand and after the daytime stocking, and this is after the nighttime stocking. So the, the uh, cream color here is, is, it, is there a walleye in the predator's stomach or not? And what you see is during the day, half, 53% of all of these predators had at least one walleye in their stomach after the day stocking, and after the night stocking, 22% of the predators had pond fingerling walleye in their stomachs. And there were some um, really, if you presented this data in a, like a percent composition by number, where you looked at how many selections each predator made, some of the bass had 25 baby walleye in their stomach. Some chain pickerel, 100 millimeter chain pickerel would have a dozen baby walleye in their stomach. So um, the, the, the pond fingerling walleye were heavily predated, and the, the, the story here is maybe we should think about stocking some walleye at night, like run and hide, uh, because a lot of these are sight-oriented predators. I don't fish for yellow perch at night, um, and most of these fish are actually sight-oriented predators that, that forage mostly during the day. Uh, so some evaluation uh, techniques. Um, uh, Tom Brooking from Cornell uh, helped organize a, a 10 uh, gillnet survey um, around the lake. Um, and DEC then came in and did the standard walleye gillnetting. Um, and they've done the netting in 2002, 2007, 2013, and 2017. Here are the results in catch per net um, among all those years, uh, 12.4, 13, 16, five and eight, and this is a little bit interesting to me. These over here, I would call pretty darn good gillnet catch rates, um, even when you compare them with some of the other pretty good um, you know, wall walleye waters in New York. And then over here, Scott and I were talking about this earlier, what the heck, what's going on over here? Um, and maybe anglers had started to uh, find the walleye and started to catch them, removing them from the system. Or it's something else that we don't quite understand yet, and, and we need to dive a little further into this. But I don't have a really great explanation to why uh, the uh, gillnet catch rate dropped up. But what I can say is that, so this is our index of abundance, right, gillnet catch rate. And we also did uh, a, a mark and recapture study. So these are the, this is a mark and recapture study. This is the number of walleye that we actually think are in the lake. And again, uh, John and a bunch of the students really did most of the work on this. Um, and what we do see though, remember I showed you the figure over here before uh, with the reduction in gillnet catch rate, we do see it show up over here also in the population estimate. Okay, so I kind of believe that's real, um, but I'm not exactly sure what the cause is. Okay, and so then um, take a look at the, the first two times that the lake was gillnetted. Uh, and we take a look at, you know, the size of those fish. Walleye are super fat when alewife were very abundant. Um, and a large portion of the fish are actually, this is a legal size uh, line snapped right on there at 15 inches. And if you take a look at it a different way, it's a table from one of the papers. Uh, in 2002, uh, about half of the walleye are uh, legal size. And then in, in uh, 2007, the second time it was netted, almost 87% um, you know, of the walleye were illegal size. If you look at what they were eating, they were either their stomachs were empty or they had alewife in the stomach. So 65% uh, of the fish had alewife or they were empty. 37% had alewife or 60% were empty. So either you were eating alewife or the stomach was empty, essentially. 
And then remember that ratio of unclipped fish, those pond fingerling fish, that five to one ratio? Remember that we talked about um, pond fish versus advanced fish? Um, the number of unclipped walleye indicating a pond fingerling origin, 95%, uh, 90% in 2002 and 2007, respectively. So the pond, even though heavy predation was being um, um, put on these pond fish, they were still showing up with a higher frequency in the gill nets compared to the fall fish. So the pond fish, in my mind, are a better investment. Um, what happened with outlife? You've already heard that um, we've almost or lost outlife completely from the lake. So this is another graphic pulled from uh, uh, one of uh, uh, Nick Sanchez John's students' posters. Um, this is what's happened with the outlife population over that time period. Okay, so we've already heard about that. Whether it can be explained, where's Dan Stitch? Dan is probably working on the model right now, a bioenergetics <laughs> model. Can walleye, have walleye caused the decline in this? So there may be another chapter to be written. Um, our walleye, uh, so we've done some growth work on them. Long story short, they top out between five and 600 millimeters, uh, and um, they're, they, they're looking fairly old, 10, 12 years old. And those fish are actually quite nice now, and you'll see a picture of them in a few minutes. Uh, one, one of the little hidden gems of some of this research that um, I think is really cool, and this is another little graphic I snipped from one of John's students' papers, is um, think of the lake depth this way. This is shallow, and this is deep. And this solid bar is when alewife are super abundant in super abundant years. And the hollow graph here is when uh, alewife are very low abundance. So take a look here. Walleye utilize different areas when alewives are abundant versus scarce. During high alewife abundance, walleye were located in the deepest portion of the lake versus when alewife were low abundance, they were located in the shallowest portion of the lake. This is me coming back to my weed walleye versus my open water pelagic walleye that's out there foraging for this offshore alewife, right? Versus they're in the weeds foraging for a normal-ish perch. Okay, um, that's, I kind of like that graphic. I, I'm, I may be the only one. <laughs> um, uh, John and, and some of the students have also done some great work trying to uh, look at, um, you know, does electrofishing catch rate match up with the population estimate? Does the gill net catch rate match up with the population estimate? Um, pretty much the, the, the best one that we've come up with so far, and this is driven, this whole relationship is driven a lot by Cornell's data. Um, so you've got, you know, Oneida here, or all the blue. Um, you've got Canada Dorego here with the, the, uh, the green. Uh, and then you've got one little uh, Otsego box here. Um, we're going to add three more to this with other population estimates. Canisius. Canisius is on there now, too. That's good. Um, Otsego, the point of this is Otsego is a little bit of an outlier. Because it is so bathtub shaped, we're setting the gill nets in the perfect spot. And what happens is, in, in my mind, my interpretation of this is that because we're setting the gill nets in the perfect spot, the gill net catch rate um, is higher than it should be given the actual number of walleye there in the lake. So the index of abundance, the catch per net, doesn't quite fit the relationship of the other walleye lakes um, because we're setting it in the perfect spot to catch those walleye. Hopefully you follow that. So, um, Alwife are, we'll call extirpated. They are not showing up in the last four years in our trap nets. They're not showing up in the last four years in our gill nets. They're not showing up in any predator stomachs. Um, no method of looking for alwife has found an alwife. Um, I th personally, I'm not ready to say alwife are gone, um, but they're, they're beyond low to detection. Um, so walleye in almost every other predator fish are running around not eating perch. I'm catching lake trout with perch in their stomachs. I'm catching lake trout with pickerel in their stomachs. I'm catching lake trout with walleye in their stomachs. Um, lake trout are now in the littoral, foraging right out here in six feet of water. Um, and so are walleye. Um, so everything is now, in, in my mind, uh, foraging in the littoral when the lake is is um, destratified with the case of lake trout. Um, 
walleye also eat other things. Um, this is a, a picture of a uh, Atlantic salmon right out here when DC was still stocking Atlantic salmon. We would catch walleyes that were puking up trout and, and salmon. So walleye do eat other things. Um, so this just in, we're also doing, and we have uh, 25 years of ice fishery data out here. So we go out and any year there's good ice, we're out here doing an ice fishery survey. So right now, this year, it's a good year for ice. And um, of the fishermen that have been interviewed, one third of all anglers interviewed in a, in a, in a basic question, like, hey, what are you fishing for, have indicated that they're fishing for walleyes. Uh, so the walleye are there, the walleye are doing well, and fishermen are fishing for them, and they're catching them. So this, is a, this was taken 100 yards right off the beach here. Uh, this is my friend Dan. Uh, he landed two really nice walleyes the other night. Uh, so takeaway message, we're winding down here. Uh, so what have we learned? Uh, stock walleye did very well, uh, even though they were heavily predated on. Um, pond fingerling walleyes appear to be a better investment, and stocking at night seems to help. Um, now, there's a little caveat there, um, you know, we, we, and the reason I say that is because they're showing up at a higher rate in the gillnet catch. Um, now, if you catch an unclipped walleye, it's wild, all right? So, um, in the last four years, we can't discern what's happening. Um, you know, the, the, we haven't stocked pond fingerling walleye in four years, but there's been some natural reproduction <coughs> that has taken off since owl life. We never really expected owl life to be completely gone. Actually, we thought that we were going to if the DEC would let us make a commitment to almost stop walleye forever because owl life would essentially eliminate the recruitment of walleye, they'll eat all their fry, right? So we kind of anticipate we're gonna to have to stop forever. But with wall with owl life being gone, we're getting natural recruitment of, uh, of walleye. So the gillnet catch rates are good. Walleye eat owl life, owl life are gone. They switched over to perch. Walleyes are spawning naturally. There's been no stocking since 2014. Anglers are targeting walleye and catching them. And the last slide and the first slide are of my son. Uh, right out here, um, this is my son with a, right out here, right in front of the, right, 100 yards this way. Uh, this was last weekend on a Swedish pimple. My son, Marlin, caught a, uh, a little wild um, produced walleye in the lake. So that was really cool. He got to reel in one. Um, and so, um, Scott and I were chatting, you know, do we have a sustainable fishery? Have we accomplished the goal? Um, my take on it is, as long as our life are gone, it may be the answer is yes. So, I'll leave you with that. <laughs>